I'm starting from verse 1. I'm just going to read. In fact, I'll read from here. It says, Therefore, when there's therefore in a passage, it is there for something, for a purpose. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Question, where is Jesus? At the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Father God, we recognize that you have always been with us. You've never let City Hill down, and you never will. You are faithful, Father. Your faithfulness, Lord, will go from this generation to the next generation. And we can look back and ask the generations that have gone before, and they will testify of your faithfulness. And we know, Lord, that you are good to all. You're so loving. You're so mighty. You're so great. And, Lord, we want to enjoy you in 2018. We want to rejoice and fellowship with you. We want to spend time with you and enjoy who you are. I pray, Father God, as Paul says in Ephesians 1.18, May our hearts be enlightened. Open the eyes of our hearts that we might see you for who you are. That you might help us, Lord, and navigate our path and help us, Lord, to get to a place where you want us to go. I pray, Lord, that none of us will be lost. I pray, Lord, that friends will finish together in in leading up to 2019 and beyond that. I pray, Lord, you'll keep us, you'll strengthen us. I pray as you add others Among us, Lord, I pray that they too will feel like they're part of this family. I pray, Lord, bless us, strengthen us as a family. Take us on into greater things. I pray may your kingdom come in this church, and may your kingdom come in this city as a result of the church. I pray, Lord, may you strengthen our feeble knees, and may you, Lord Jesus, take us on into great things. I bless your name, Lord, and I thank you so much for everything you've done. We look forward to great things that you have in store for us. And we recognize that it's all for Jesus' glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul is using this imagery, is using this metaphor, if you like. And um, it's an athletic um, image that we're getting or imagery that we're getting here. And he's talking about running the race. So which means all of us here... The writer of Hebrews, did I say Paul? The writer of Hebrews is speaking here about a race that every believer is having to run or is running. If you become a Christian, the day that you become a Christian, the day that you give your life to Jesus Christ is the day that you sign up to start running the race. And the writer of Hebrews is recognizing that every Christian, every person who is a believer in Jesus Christ has signed up for a race that they will run for the rest of their lives. And this is just a metaphor to describe and to help us to understand this gospel, but understand what Christian life is like. But understand also that the faith that we found in Jesus Christ, what does it look look like? It looks like a race, a race that we are having to run and run for many, many years. You wake up tomorrow morning, you are running your race. You wake up the day after tomorrow, you are running this race. In 2019, you will still be running the race that God has designated for you. But the way Paul is, uh, the writer of Hebrews is referring to this, I said Paul again. Every time I say Paul, raise your hand. I want to see who's, who's listening and who's not. <laughs> Paul? Oh, okay, there are a few people there. 
<laughs> the writer of Hebrews, by the way, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, but Hebrews is written to a church that seems to be really struggling and going through a really difficult time. And the writer is really helping the church to come to its uh, purpose to fulfill every purpose in God that God is, has in store for, for her. But it's not just the writer of Hebrews who's using this image, who's using this metaphor of a race. Paul is using it as well in First Corinthians. <laughs> Great, that's good. We are all listening. And, he, and the writer is referring to a race that is marked out for each and every one of us. But this race is not an easy race. And by the way, it's not a walk in the park. One of the things we need to settle that it is not just a smooth ride, easy, ch uh, just chilled, simple race that doesn't require training, that doesn't require endurance, that doesn't require strict um, training where you beat your body to enable yourself to get ready for a race. I don't know how many people here have ever run a race. Who has ever run a race? That's less than our fault. But anyway, I did that in school. But, but this kind of race is not a sprint. This is like a marathon. How many people have ever run a marathon? Well, fewer than I thought. But the, the, before you run a marathon, you need to exercise, you need to train, you need to spend time, you need to engage your body and make sure that your body is fit for the race. And Paul, the writer of Hebrews, great, the right, I think I'm going to make this mistake all the time. I might as well just have your hands up all the time. But the writer of Hebrews, what he's trying to do is he's trying to help us to understand what this race looks like. And it has very steepy, steep uh, places. It has windy places where it's not such an easy race that you are having to run. And it's not a race that will last only for today. It's not a race that is a sprint and you finished in about a, two, a few seconds. But this is going to be a race that's going to last a long time. And you've got to prepare yourself because you've signed up for it. But what he's also saying is that as you run this race, you've got to recognize that certain things that are happening. The first thing that is, you've got to recognize is that when you enter the race, there might be certain things that are clinging on to you. And those things are, number one, he talks about the weight that is on you. Secondly, he talks about the sin that could easily entangle you to a point that you're not going to be able to, to run. So, for instance, one of the things that you need to know when you run a marathon, although I've never done it myself, but I have honestly observed from the distance, one of the things that you, run, you do when you run a marathon is that you try not to carry stuff. Because if you carry anything, it adds weight to you and it might be hard for you to run. Imagine you carrying low, someone as you are running the race to prove how strong you are. The thing is, you can run for a while, but you're going to run out of energy. But Paul, the writer of Hebrews, is trying to say, no, that's not how you're supposed to run. Make sure there is no weight that could stop you or hinder you from continuing your race. And may I say this, the reason the writer of Hebrews is saying this is because as we run the race, we do sometimes load things onto ourselves that will hinder us from finishing well and finishing strong. We put things that we don't realize are the sort of things that are going to hinder us from running the race and we actually are blaming God why we've not been very successful in our race. But realize that the writer is not saying get rid of sin that will hinder you in the race. He's saying, get rid of the weight and sin, which means there are two things that you could carry as you run your Christian race. That means you can carry things that will, are not going to help you, but are not necessarily sinful. Do you know that's the case? For an example, 
Some of you might be carrying busyness. You are so busy doing stuff. You are so busy with your job and other things. And the city is such an incredible city that it keeps you so busy. I'm one of the people to repent on that. It keeps you so busy. Oh, who else has to repent? No, I'm kidding. No, oh, Jeff. <laughs> you are so busy with so much that it really is no time for God. It's no time for prayer. You wake up early in the morning, it's your job. You go, before you go to sleep, when you get home, you've got so much. There's always so much on the plate that you've got to do. And I'll tell you one thing, what that does, it just adds the weight on you. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that's sinful, but it's the weight that comes on you, which hinders you from running really well. What about disappointment? Disappointment, if we if I feel disappointed with something, I always look at the past. I always dwell on what was. I always hover something in my heart. And my disappointment, the way I can deal with disappointment, can hinder me from fulfilling what God wants me to fulfill. And by the way, I've not seen it anywhere in the Bible where it says disappointment is a sin. What about low self-image? Or lack of identity in God, rather. That is one of the things that could hinder us. Because God can entrust things to you. And you, all the time you're saying, that's not for me. Because I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. And what you are doing is you're just adding the weight that was not given to you by God. And God wants to set you free from that weight so that you might run with perseverance. Because this race is long. It's going to take years. But it requires us to deal with the things that we are on us and are clinging on us right now so that we are free to run the race. There are many things that could hinder us from running the race. So, for instance, insecurity. My insecurity, where I don't find security in God, can hinder me. Where I look at other people as well and look at how they're doing. Instead of looking at my race in God, I just look at those people who are running alongside me and compare myself with them. And I'm so insecure that I don't look at what God has entrusted to me. I always look at what those around me are doing. What about fatigue? Sometimes that's because we're always working hard. And Dubai demands a lot out of you. And if you don't deliver, then... It spits you out. But friends, where do we find our energy? We find our energy on our knees before God and don't let fatigue take over and steal your joy in God that your time of prayer has just become a duty. But let it be a time that you enjoy and you celebrate and you enjoy God and you rejoice in Him. When you feel tired, go back to him and he will give you strength. What about doubt? Doubt can be one of those things. I haven't seen it in the Bible where doubt is sinful. Remember Thomas, the doubter? Jesus didn't say, I rebuke you, Satan. But he went and showed Thomas and said, this is a proof that I am the resurrected Christ. It's what you do with your doubt. What do you do with your doubt? When you doubt something, when you're not sure about something, what do you do? Do you put God aside? Do you decide to stop and go back on your race that's really so well marked out for you? Do you decide to give it up, call it quits at that point? Do you decide to call God a liar? To say God has forsaken you, has let you down. Or that you don't believe he exists anymore just because he, things don't work out quite the same way as you planned. Let me just challenge you. That all these things are a weight on our shoulders. A weight that if we don't deal with could hinder us from fulfilling all the things that God wants us to fulfill. What about how we deal with our temper? What about passivity? Not being active. 
not taking responsibility. We call it laid back. Friends, when you read Paul in 1 Corinthians, he says this race that you run, you got to win. And he says there's a prize that's there for you. And when we allow this weight, what it does as you enter 2018 is that you find yourself where you are right now having not made progress because you've not dealt with the weight that is on you right now. Some of the weight is uncalled for, pain and suffering. How you deal with those things that either will stifle you from running well or would actually accelerate you and make you run with perseverance, the race that's marked out for you. It's the weight, but it's also the sin. Someone once said, you either master sin or it masters you. One has to master the other. It's either I master it, I know its tricks, I know how it kind of works because it's full of surprises, or it works me out, it figures me out, and it knows my, my next move. Here is the truth. This race that we are running, the mission of sin, from the beginning of sin, has always been to make sure I don't even start the race. Sin has a mission, and its mission is to make sure I don't even start the race that is marked out for me. But should I be stubborn? And the fact that you are a believer today is because you've been stubborn. And you decided against all odds to throw away sin and to engage with Christ. But the fact that we've done that, let me tell you this. The purpose and the mission of sin will always be to grab you and to make sure you can't finish. That's the mission of sin. Sin is on a mission, but so are you. So is God. The question is, who wins the race? Will you get to the end? Will you finish strong? Will you make progress? Will you go from strength to strength? Or will you allow it to master you and to hold you down? and to entangle you to a point that you can't run. But then the writer says, we got to run with perseverance. But listen to this. The Bible never says, do something without saying there is the answer in how to do it. And it's not mind over matter. That I gotta think, I gotta run. Tomorrow morning, I gotta remember that there's a race and I gotta run. The guys who are worship leaders gotta come up with songs to remind us that we are in the race so that we don't forget that we are in this race. You put the alarm clock on so that some, you, you might remember that you're still in the race or you get someone who's close to you to remind you that you are in the race. No, that's not how it works. And it's not convincing your mind all the time I'm in the race, I'm in the race, I'm in the race, I'm in the race. That's not gonna work. But the Bible provides two answers. And they are right at the beginning of the passage and right at the end of the passage. And this is the first one. It says, as you run the race, you have motivations that will allow you and help you to finish the race. And the first motivation is that you have a cloud of witnesses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses... Friends, you have people who are cheering and cheering that you might finish the race. Who are they? Are they your family? No. Are they the church? Not really. Your spouse? Not quite. But the Bible makes it very clear. That is why therefore is therefore. It's there to show us that in Hebrews 11, the writer is telling us that there are those who ran their own race. Those who ran really well and they finished very strong. 
And those are your cloud of witnesses who are watching and observing that you finish well. And those are not observing in a passive way. They are cheering you and saying, you are running a different race from the race that we've been running. And you can finish well because you got God on your side in a way that we never did. What do I mean by that? When this cloud of witnesses, when Abraham ran his race, when Moses ran his race, when David and Joshua and Isaiah and all these people ran their race, the cross was ahead of them. But when we run our race, the cross is behind us. Which means there are battles that have already been fought for us and have already been won for us. We're not just fighting in the same way as they are fighting because they're saying, you guys don't realize how lucky you are. We did not have the cross behind us. We did not have grace in the same way as you did. We had the law and that's all we had for some of them. But for you, you have them as a cloud of witnesses, as an example that this can happen and it can be won. The race can be finished. And they're looking and saying, we finished the race, guys, and we know you can finish it. And by the way, you've got something better. You've got the new covenant, something we never had. But how are they witnessing to us? They are witnessing to us through the pages of Scripture When we read them, we find that they did things and we realize that we can do far better than they did. As we run, there are those standing around us and saying, we ran, we finished. You're running, you will finish because you have something better that is allowing you to run and to finish even in a better way. Friends, as you read scripture, you will always find a cloud of witnesses who are saying it is possible to see the sick healed. It is possible to see the demons cast out. It is possible to see people restored back to God. It is possible for the kingdom of God to come and restore the city. It is possible for salvation to come to the city. It is possible for the nations of the world to be rich with the gospel. It is possible for your whole household to come to faith. It is possible for City Hill to be a light in this city. It is possible for you as an individual to shine for God in 2018. That's what they're doing. As you read scripture, they're telling you that that's possible. That means, have you ever been to a football or rugby match? It's very loud. It's very noisy. A cricket match as well. In Sports City. I invite you there. It's very loud. Why is it loud? Because there are those who are cheering and cheering for the players. And by the way, what it, the reason they're cheering and cheering louder and louder is that the opponent can't even hear. It's to dr- try and drown the noise on the other side. As you read scripture, as you open the pages of scripture, and you are faced with the weight that is on you, you are faced with the sin, as you read clouds of witnesses, they're drowning every noise of sin. They are drowning every noise of every weight that is on you because they say it is possible to overcome the weight and it is possible to overcome sin. You have a cloud of witnesses who are helping you to win the race. And secondly, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. As you run, your motivation is that Jesus is there. You are not running on your own. You have Jesus Christ who's standing there and is saying, I have won the race that you were supposed to run. I ran that race and I finished it so that you might not have to run a race that is that difficult. Jesus Christ has run a race for each and every one of us. The race that was set before us that we should have run, but we, there was no way we, we would have run that race and there was no way we would have completed that race. And he came and he ran that race He is the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. Our faith cannot be fully what it is without Christ. 
He is the one who went before us. He is the one who ran the race. He is the one who is saying it is possible. And by the way, when you get to the finish line, I'll be there. And by the way, I have given you the energy and the, the, the strength that you need through the power of the Holy Spirit so that you might not grow weary or lose heart or go back or decide to quit. And if there's anything that's trying to hinder you, I am with you. I will encourage you. I will lift your gaze and help you so that you might finish the race. We have Jesus uh, stand, not standing in a passive way, but seated because it is finished. When he had done everything he needed to do, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, sat down because the race has been completed on your behalf. So all the challenges, all the things that you'll encounter in 2018 are nothing compared to what has been overcome for you. And by the way, someone else has run a race similar to yours. You are not unique. And by the way, some of them didn't have the cross behind them. They'd had the cross ahead of them. And they still finished the race. My question is, are you going to give up? One of the prime ministers of the UK, I think it was in 1941, Winston Churchill, they asked him at the school to give a, a speech. And these are the words that, were, that everyone remembers. He said, never, never. And I said, never again. Never give up. And by the way, I'm not saying, don't give up. It will all be okay. I'm saying, look forward. Look to Jesus. Stand up again. Rise up again. When the world, when you feel buffeted by the world, let me just say this to you. You can finish the race. Don't look back. Don't go back. Don't, don't be stifled. Just be free to run and finish the race. That's what we're called to do. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much for your grace. I thank you so much for the race that you have in store for us. And I pray, Lord, that you help each and every one of us to run well and to finish well. I pray, Lord, that each one of us will finish strong. I pray you enable us, Lord, to run really well. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that, Lord, you might come over us and enable us, Lord, each and every one of us to not feel disqualified, to not feel like we can't do this, but, but Lord, help us to really run with perseverance the race that marked out for us. I pray friends will still be friends in 2019 and running. I pray no one will say, God doesn't care or he doesn't, he, he's not for me. I pray, Father, those who are facing challenges, I pray, Lord, may they overcome. I pray every weight will be lifted off people's shoulders right now. I pray, Lord, every challenge will be overcome. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, this is the second part. I'm coming to the second part of my message this morning. The reason I'm talking to you about a race is because what we've been doing has been a race. We've been running and we'll also be running again and again and again. As City Hill, remember we, last year in uh, January, I stood before you and we changed the name of the church from Gateway Creek to City Hill. A little, it's, it feels a bit unbelievable that it's only been a year since we've been City Hill, doesn't it? And it feels like the name stuck with us. Do you still remember Gateway Creek? Can I get those to raise their hands so that they might experience some discipline? <laughs> All right. But um, we have been through a lot together. And we started a new vision that we will be a Christ centered, gospel advancing, and city impacting church. That everything we do will be about Jesus. Will be centered around Jesus Christ. And the purpose will be so that the gospel might advance, the gospel of Jesus. We might be found faithful as those who advance the gospel both in the city and in the nations of the world, but also that we might impact the city that God has given to us. And we also said that on this vision, Christ, Christ centered gospel advancing, city impacting church, that we want to be on this vision, there are four pillars that this vision rests on, sorry. And those four pillars are gospel, that we want to be a people 
who are so gospel-centered. We make our decisions based on the gospel. We, we make our choices based on it. We live our lives for the glory of Christ. And secondly, community. That we'll be a people who embrace community. That we love one another. We care for one another. And we believe that we are not a nameless, faceless army. We are a community of the Spirit. Thirdly, city and culture that God has entrusted Dubai to us to be a people who will transform this city for the glory of God. That God has put us here as City Hill to be a city up in this city, a city on a hill that can never be hidden. And lastly, a movement that we are not just um, a church that exists in Dubai because we are a few experts that come together. But we are here for something bigger that will touch and impact the world. That's what we set out last year. And let me remind you, we've not let go of that. We're still embracing it, and we're still moving ahead. We are forging ahead, and we believe that this year, what we need to do is strengthen that vision and lengthen that vision. That's what Isaiah says. It's about strengthening and lengthening so that we see God come upon us and reach this city. Just a few things just before I go on to all the new things about this vision and how we develop it. Let me just make a few announcements. The first one is Steve Oliver is going to be with us on the 12th of January. He'll be preaching here with us on the 12th, which is next Friday. And by the way, we are here. On the 19th of January, Clive Chernick will be with us here. And he he will come and speak with us. And as far as I know, we are here. But also, there's something to let you know, that uh, at the end of this month, we'll be working on a huge campaign where we will profile all the ministry team leaders and all the teams, but also a campaign where we are asking people to join these men and women who've been working really hard and been serving so well And some are serving so well behind the scene who need our support and need some of us to really get in there and help them. So you will know all the ministry leaders, what they're doing, all the different ministries, different teams that are operating in City Hill. But also you know the new leaders that have come through over the last year or so and also know what their demands are. And I just want to say thank you very much, City Hill. Those who have been very faithful in serving so well and so faithfully. Particularly, let me just say it, Christmas, that season, we served so well. And I just want to say, for every person who's involved, who's caught up, who's serving, those who are doing this, even the small things, things behind the scene, sometimes a one-off contribution here and there, I just want to say thank you. And why don't we applaud them? But now, let's come to our vision. The only way I can ever describe our vision or talk about our vision is to fit it very well within those four pillars. And I'm going to start with the gospel. And by the way, the person who don't don't show this, and I want to do this and then show it after. Can you just... It's going to take a while. Yep, that's good. One of the things that we want to do that we're looking forward to doing is to really see our work among men being one of the most established work we have. Men who are on fire for God, full of the Holy Spirit, strong and really going for God. Men who are not passive but are taking responsibility, so on fire, active and serving and really love and know their scripture. So for that reason, we will be starting a men's B&B. Don't worry, it's not a bed and breakfast. And men, you are not invited should we have a bed and breakfast. But anyway, it's men's Bible and breakfast. Where men can come together and really look into the word of God, dig deeper in the word, and really understand the word of God. Build relationship, ask questions, and really rub shoulders together. Where we can sit down and engage with God where it's just men. And look into some of these things. So the purpose of that is that as a, gospel, as a gospel-shaped people is to see men who are very gospel-centered. The second thing 
I will be asking some people to stand, by the way, as I do this. The second thing is in March this year, we will have our first main event, which is women's event in City Hill. Ladies, you don't sound excited. I'm a man, but I'm more excited than you. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you should invite me. Anyway, Ayona, can you just stand? Ayona will be leading that if you don't know who she is. And I'm hoping and trusting God that as you gather, you will really grow in the grace of God and love the gospel and see the gospel as God sees it and really understand who you are in Christ. So I'm really excited for this event, and I'm sure there'll be more in the future. And by the way, if you all sign up for that event, and we see all our ladies so on fire for God, we can turn the world upside down. And I mean, the guys, we're going to turn the world upside down too. <laughs> but with breakfast. <laughs> and the men's event will be once every month where we come together and we can really dig deep in the word of God and we can understand scripture. So we'll be going through a book together and um, really going for that. The other thing is uh, we want to really strengthen our ministry team and our ministry on a Friday morning. One of the things that we haven't been able to do very well is do altar calls, especially after the meeting, and really pray for people. Let me just say this. I remember when I first became a Christian, one of the things I used to do, by the way, you're not allowed to repeat it this anywhere. Every altar call I used to be at the front. And by the way, let me just encourage you. God really did something in my life through that. And let us be those who are not shy at responding to the words because when we are ministered to, we are strengthened and it gives us the opportunity to minister to others as well. So we want to strengthen our ministry team, but also we want, through the preaching of the word, to make altar calls for salvation because we believe that God wants to save Dubai so that we are trusting God that every meeting, every preach, there will be the ability to really trust God to do the work of salvation. We want to see salvation among us. And I believe when we strengthen this ministry, will also help us. And also the preaching of the world will be geared also towards helping people to find their way to Christ. And that's one of the ways that the gospel will advance and we make sure that we are very gospel-centered and very outward-looking. You can show that. The second one is community. One of the first things that we want to do is we want to make sure that our city groups are really strengthened. And for, for that reason, one of the things that we would implement in the new year is what I will call, don't show this one please, show the first one, just show the first one and let people just see. Sapna, I feel like you're giving too much away, yeah? I'm kidding, it's okay. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure is our city groups are really strengthened and are strong in God. And for that reason, we want to establish a pastoral team, a team of men and women whose responsibility will be to support city group leaders. What they will do is spend time with city group leaders, find out how they're doing, and really pray with them and strengthen them and help them if city groups are struggling, see how they can work together with them to strengthen those city groups. But also sometimes, and particularly myself, now that I just got married, I need to sort my life out. I've been told by many people, and I'm busy doing that. But one of the things that happened, especially on a Friday morning, is that I get a lot of stuff that should have gone to city group leaders but comes directly to me. And I'm hoping that our city group leaders will be rechanneled and refocused, but also will have the pastoral team to give support and be pillars in strengthening and helping city groups so that there's life and health in the city groups. So they review how city groups are doing and checking if there's health in city groups or if those city groups need a bit of renewal in them as well. Also, we want to start new city groups. We want to see some city groups multiply, and I'm already thinking of some at the moment, and one of them is in Sharjah. And also, we want to start a city group in Maidan South. 
District 11. Anyone from Maiden South here? Wow. There's two there. There's three. But we have quite a few people from Maiden South, and we want to establish a city group there. This is just, uh, the next one is just something that I've been carrying on my heart for a while. And I would like to call it adoption campaign. <laughs> and the reason I'm calling that adoption campaign is because I would love to see families and couples beginning to adopt some of our singles in the church. Let me tell you why. Dubai can be a very lonely place. And people need family. They need a sense of belonging. They need people they can talk about certain things that they're not able to talk about in, 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 in any context. Certain things that they might not feel the freedom to talk about them in city group context. I would love for some of you to be mothers and fathers of those who are single. Singles, don't say I didn't do this. I did it for you. And, and I want to say this. Let this be a campaign that begins today. As a couple, why don't you go to, some, to someone that you know is single and say, listen, come over for a meal. We want to spend more time with you. Come after church on a Friday. We want to spend more time with you and just embrace them and make a family. Let us be real. Let us be authentic. But let us be in one another's lives. Let us help one another. The issues that we are facing here. And let's not hide. Let us really be those who are transformed because we are a family and we are a community. So, Couples, get going. Singles, if you feel, okay, if you feel lonely, singles, don't interpret it out of context. If you feel lonely, singles, please invite yourself, but in the most polite way. I know it's the most, we have one of the most cross-cultural church I've ever seen. When I say invite yourself, I don't say knock on the door and say I'm here. The second one, the next one, is these are some of the things we would love to establish. The first one is, as part of community, is a marriage course. And for that, I'll ask Kevin and Ann to stand. Where are they? Kevin and Ann will be establishing a marriage course in our church. And by the way, don't go to them now and say, our marriage is struggling. We need your help right now. Because they are... They will be putting together a team and there will be trial running this to see how it's going to work. The material is already there and we're getting more material. We want to make sure that they have a team around them and they can run this. We want to build a good community, a genuine community. We don't want things to fall by the wayside. We want to make sure we pick up the button and we run with it, that we have healthy marriages in the church. The second one is freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ has been an incredible cause Around the world, I've seen people's lives change. I've done freedom in Christ my, myself, and it really has helped me a lot. I did it many years ago. And I know in this church, there are four couples who are busy going through freedom in Christ, and they're loving it, and they're enjoying it. Can you guys just raise up your hand if you're doing freedom in Christ right now? There you go, there you go, there you go. Has it not been amazing? <laughs> but you've got to be honest, it's been extremely challenging as well. Very. And it brings... <laughs> It brings things to the surface. Guys, we want to establish that in our church to help people with many, many things, addictions, to help people with things like you know, the past and the history and all these things that we are struggling with that sometimes we don't tell anybody. We want us to see a healthy church here. Last one on that on communities, money management and debt, debt counseling course. Epen and Elizabeth, can I ask you to stand? This couple will be running our money management and debt counseling course. And by the way, let me just say this. They're not going to be running it on their own. And don't go to them straight after this meeting and say, I'm drowning in debt, help me now. Because they're busy sorting this out and pulling the team together. With all these teams, once everything is in place, we will bring them here, pray for them, and get going. But I don't want the whole church to flock to them. And that will present many problems. The third one is culture and city. One of the things I said, so you can go to the next one, but not the next one after that. Just leave it to this one. The next one is culture and city. Let me just say this. We want to reach our community. And Dubai is not a place where you can go out there and give some handouts and tell them.
people in the street about Jesus. I believe we need to be very shrewd, very wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So, the first one is some of our events that we want to do in City Hill. Did you not enjoy, if you didn't, please, we don't want facade, or you, if you didn't, do say, and I'm going to do this, if you didn't, I'm kidding, but did you not enjoy our kids' um, event on the 8th of December? It's all the mothers and fathers. Can I just, if, if you did enjoy it, just raise up your hand. It just goes to show. No one enjoyed it? If you did enjoy it. Great. For those who are not here, you are excused. And so we will be having three of those City Kids events this year here in City Hill where we're going to see our children really do stuff. And we're going to be sitting there and watching our children here, learning so much about God and putting that on display here. And this is a great opportunity for families to invite other families with kids and say, come and see what our kids are doing. And it's a good opportunity to, start to engage with people. Secondly, community events. We want to do more community events so that we can engage with the community. A good opportunity for you to invite friends and family and say, we have this event and we would love you to come. And people can come and experience the church. I remember last year, one of the things that I had the opportunity of doing is, was meet someone outside who came, who, on the 8th who was here for a City Kids event. And this lady said, I've never been to church before. He said, sir, how, what about this morning? He said, I'm from Abu Dhabi. I came here because one of the kids I was teaching is performing this morning. And I've never been to church before, and I'm here for that purpose. So that's what I want us to do. With all our social events, with all our community events, an opportunity for us to draw people so that they realize we are actually normal. And with that, <laughs> and with that in mind, they can realize that um, we need the gospel. The next one is about the Philippine consulate. I want more opportunities like that. And I do believe that we need to be support these guys and make sure that we are healing our community out there and we are ensuring that the gospel is bearing fruit and we are salt and light in our community because the church is not just stealing from the culture or taking from the culture. The church needs to invest back in the culture. And if this is one of those opportunities, let us really do well in it but also let us support it. And lastly, on that, is our training of the Ajman guys who come by a bus. And uh, I've spoken to Frank and the simplest, way simple. If Frank is here and simplest, can you guys stand, way simplest? Is he left? Oh, there's simplest. Simplest is one of the guys who are gonna be doing training with uh, our Ajman guys so that we are speaking into some of the hard, issues of our culture and of our, our city. And by the way, I didn't ask the city kids uh, leader to stand. Dalreen, could you please stand so people know who you are. That's Dalreen who has been leading very faithfully in our city kids event. Lastly, it's our City Hill Global, which is a movement. This year, we've been able to establish, at least on the website, and uh, We've been able to create a context where our work in the nations can grow and expand. And we have been able to brand that and call City Hill Global. City Hill Global is a vehicle that City Hill are using to really reach the nations of the world. Because as you remember, we've been given words about really being a blessing to the nations of the world. And City Hill Global, this year, will be establishing a City Hill Global team that will be based here in Dubai with the responsibility of making sure that we serve the nations well, so I'm not zooming around on my own doing stuff, but also I'm not the only one who's in the, who in the nations, but also we don't have this gap between the nations and the local church that we see ourselves as a movement, as part of a bigger movement that's reaching the nations. Men and women who will also help me with the balance and the tension between the two. And let me say this, it is a tension and it will always be a tension. 
and also you don't start with one and do the other. It's always hold them in tandem. But also, we are, I'm also gathering a City Hill global team here in Dubai, which consists of leaders from around the world, and that's going to be in November. Remember November, we don't have the hub, but there will be leaders from around the world who will be coming to form a team that will help and oversee the work that we have initiated in the nations of the world. And when they come, one of the things we will be doing is we will be, together at City Hill, planting a church into Sharjah. In November 2018, we are planting a church into Sharjah. And let me say this, it is not easy. I'm not trying to create hype from here or make it sound like it's going to be a walk in the park. Like I said, this race is not easy. But hey, God wants us to reach Sharjah. And this is how we're going to reach him. But let me say this. That's why we need to strengthen the work that we are doing in City Hill. We cannot do anything in City Hill if we ourselves are not strong. We cannot uh, plant out of weakness. We need to plant out of strength. And that's why everything that we've said so far is to ensure that we strengthen the work so that when we lengthen, we lengthen with such great integrity, but also doing really well here. So 2018 November, do know that we will be planting City Hill in Sharjah. And let me just say this. Some of you already knew about that. And the reason is because at the hub, it was mentioned without my permission. I had mentioned it to our global team when we gathered together, and I said it is something that will be said at the vision morning, which is today. Unbeknown to me and the leaders, it was mentioned. And for that, I want to say I'm really sorry, because that was not my plan. For you to hear, it's not a great vine, but to hear from um, that, in that context. Lastly, there will be City Hill Global Trips that will take place this year and th that we will participate in. The first one is to China, that Joel already, that stand up Joel, no, he's already standing, that Joel over there. <laughs> <laughs> That Joel will be leading that team. And I'm trusting God that we'll lead a team into Liberia in 2018 and also the Philippines. So those are the three trips I can say we can manage. We can't manage more than that. And let me tell you where we are, City Hill Global. Right now, under what I will be gathering as a team and people, both here and in the nations, we find ourselves in the Philippines, we are in China, we are in Pakistan, we are in the UAE, we are in Liberia, we are in the UK, and we are in Holland. That's where we are. In some of those countries, we have two churches. In some of those countries, we have two and a half churches. I, I don't have to explain what a half is, but I'll explain later. But that's where we are right now. And the work is going to grow and grow and grow. That's why we need to be wise right now and build well so that we can manage that load. And by the way, that was not done to me. It was done to all of us. What we've been able to do, we've been able to do together. It's not me doing it. It's us going as a movement of people and shaping and changing the world. Let us applaud City Hill for all the great work that you've been able to do. I can ask the team to come now, and uh, just in closing, things that will come. The first one is uh, in February, we'll have a prayer and fasting, as we do every year. It's been our propensity or tendency to do that, and I would love us to pray through some of these things that we shared, so we're going to have our prayer and fasting. The second one is we're going to make sure that our teams that are already in place are strengthened and that we are firing on all cylinders. And thirdly, 
we are going to establish what we will call a staff meeting that we're going to come together with a few teams that are already in place in the church to sit down, to talk about our Fridays, and to talk about all the events and the things that we are doing. So the staff meeting is happening tomorrow. That will be the first one, where we'll have at least about 15 or 16 people who are leaders in different ministries who will come together. And lastly, there will be a new badge for Cultivate Training Program that we've been running for just under a year, which we are finishing this year with an old badge, and there will be a new badge that will start sometime soon. Let's all stand. Here's my question. Do you know everything I've said, even as it is thrilling and exciting, that it requires quite a few things? Let me be honest with you. Firstly, it requires sacrifice. Secondly, it requires money. And let me just say this. We can't do it without sacrifice. We can't do it without money. But most importantly, we can't do it without Jesus. He is the only one who will allow us to fulfill all that God has got for us. I'm going to pray and I want us to worship. Father God, I thank you so much for what you have in store for us. I thank you for City Hill that we've been here, Lord. Lord, it's been two years for me in, in this church. And Lord, I know that uh, you want to take us further. You want to accelerate us. And Lord, I've really enjoyed myself running the race with this dear men and women. I want to pray right now that Lord will go from strength to strength. And Lord, I pray, may we be strengthened. And Lord, may we lengthen our calls. Father God, may we fulfill everything that you are asking and calling on us to fulfill. Let there be no hype, Lord. But maybe we take it very seriously. We know this requires sacrifice. And Lord, help us to be a sacrificial people. We know, Lord, that this requires finance. Lord, help us to be a generous people. That we might see your work in this city and in the nations fulfilled. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's applaud Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.